Talks. Okay, this is a fat badge. What we did at Maker Fair in Adelaide was we also hold a hackerspace there. And we wanted the public to be able to make something. Flinders put up the um, money for it, and that's what we ended up making. We hold a hacker, uh, three hackerspace locations in Adelaide one at, in the city. One in the south at Flinders University, we get the, to use the digital fabrication lab, and one at Woodville where we meet in a shed but the site of a small castle. So, we don't get to meet in the castle. Um, for making the fat badge, we had groups of 20 people, six groups for the day. The youngest would have been about three or four years old, and the oldest was my mum at 72. So the little ones were sitting on a parent's knee and um, poking bits in place. It's all surface mount, and people were handed out um, a container of parts. The board was screen printed with solder paste, and then they had to put the parts on the board. We then had a, a digital overhead projector, don't know what they're called, and you could see up on the screen the microprocessor so that you could get it on square and the USB connector so it wasn't shorted. Then it went in the oven, then it got checked and sat at rework for a while if it needed it, or it went straight to being flashed and then the program uploaded on it and the batteries put in and if it worked or not a Flinders Uni lanyard, and off the people went, happy. One didn't work. It was mum's. <laughs> it had been reworked already. It had had the CPU off and back on again. Two pins were shorting under the CPU. But otherwise, they all worked. We made her a new one. And that's a fat badge. The Hackerspace Adelaide website, it's in projects, in fact, badge. Okay, we need to do a laptop switch, so who is next? Uh, Trent. Trent. That's right, Trent is here. is next in the list. Oh, so, oh, so, no, 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 he's going next. He's just putting that yeah. one. Okay, yeah. all right. So, okay, you should say the next person. Oh, after Trent. Okay. Oh, you're next. Yeah, yeah I'm next. Yeah, yeah. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Okay. <laughs> Do you want handheld or lapel? Uh, the lapel's probably Test, test. Okay, everyone here okay? Yes. All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is uh, Trent, I'm Lafayette on IRC and such. Just want to give you a quick run through some stuff I've been working on, but specifically how we can do some uh, microcontroller development on Linux with a Bluetooth low energy um, 
uh, device. It looks pretty cool. So a little bit of backstory about why I started doing this. Uh, last year we built a new house and uh, building a new house is a great time dealing with builders and all that sort of thing. Uh, but mostly I just wanted to jam as much gadgetry and connected stuff in there as I could. Uh, so I started looking around at some products. Uh, one of the things I found I really liked was this Insteon line of um, lighting it would let me basically have every light controllable um, via the network, but also they had a really great range of switches. I don't know why uh, electric companies don't have better switches with labels on the stuff, but these guys did. Um, so that was great, so I could label all my switches and have them on the network. Uh, so invariably, the house got built with normal lights. I tore all of it out of the roof, chased some holes in the wall, made some modifications in the roof, and now I have 27 channels of dimming and fan control and such for the entire house. That includes the toilet. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are some problems with this. Uh, Australia has a different frequency for sort of wireless devices than uh, the US, which turns into a bit of a pain because we, don't, we can't get sort of the same devices. It's literally like, it's like a one megahertz gap in the middle. Um, so while it was cool, it was like I couldn't import a whole bunch of extra stuff we could do in the US. So I was thinking about other solutions. In the meantime, I got some air conditioning installed, managed to get an ethernet connection for that. Uh, JSON API, they gave me documentation for, very surprised. I installed an alarm, also has ethernet, and now I graph everything about my house. <laughs> so uh, you can see solar power generated, uh, the temperature in every single room, uh, the weather station, uh, you know, everything you want. There's sort of a weak view. Uh, but I only had solar view, I didn't have view on the power, so I built a little system to check how much power I was using. Little light dependent resistor on the power meter and the power board that flashes. Uh, hacked up a small solution. Uh, not sure what they thought when they checked the power uh, looking at that, <laughs> but it's literally a little uh, 433 megahertz transmitter wired onto a relay, uh, which is wired onto the LDR. Um, good times. It ran out of battery every two days, but that's fine. Uh, it worked though. So you can see here at night I'm using power, and in the day as the solar starts to ramp up, the power mostly drops off. I think this is every time I boil the kettle or turn the aircon up or turn the microwave on. And at night, you can see the solar goes down and very smoothly switches over to input power. Wanted some more granularity, so I got some uh, current transducers. You just basically put them over each circuit in your meter board. And um, you can monitor every circuit just for fun. So I wanted to do it with Bluetooth because I was sick of all these dodgy you know, frequencies. And some work in Australia and some don't. So I found this cheap little $20 board so from Nordic Semiconductor Bluetooth 4 development kit. Um, looks pretty cool. Not only is it Bluetooth LE, but it's got an ARM Cortex you can program. So you can, uh, you can do that. Very low power. And the official SDK has uh, make files that work on Linux with the standard GCC for ARM that you can install out of your package manager. So that was great. It's got a million examples for doing Bluetooth or even just UARTs and PWM and all sorts of stuff. Um, that's just what it, that's literally out of the box from the SDK from the developer. So I thought that was pretty cool. Only problem was programming them. Uh, so to program that board I bought for $15, it turns out I needed a $600 J-Link programmer. Um, I guess they got to pay all the software dev time. Uh, there is actually an educational version. It's only $100. It's the exact same device, but it's white, and you can't use it for commercial purposes. Uh, but I discovered the Open OCD project, which lets you flash a whole range of microcontrollers with a whole range of hardware uh, interfaces, including the SysFS GPIO. So I thought, cool, I can use my BeagleBone Black, connect a few wires up, and I can program the board. Uh, one, minute. one minute, yep. So I, uh, I launched OpenOCD, I programmed it, the config and everything to um, work, and it just came out like that. And I thought, there must be some kind of problem with my SysFS GPIO. The guy that wrote it made it for Raspberry Pi. I was making it work on BeagleBone. Something was clearly wrong. So I gave up, I went and bought the next generation uh, from Nordic. Uh, they have an official dev board, $120, which is actually really good for an official dev board. Um, same you know, SDK and everything, but it includes a J-Link on board. So for $100, we get the dev kit with the J-Link on board pricing. Um, you'd be mistaken for thinking the big white chip in the middle is the Bluetooth chip. It's not, it's the little one on the right. That one there is the J-Link on board. <laughs> That's the size of the actual chip. Uh, so I basically got that in, it had a proper J-Link, I thought it was all going to work, and I launched OpenOCD, and I got the same thing. I was like, oh, what have I done? Turns out, didn't read the documentation, RTFM, you have to tell Net to OpenOCD in order to use it. Didn't know that. Uh, so long story short, you can just buy the $15 board, and it works fine. Um, but the great news is, uh, you can program on Linux, you can compile on Linux, there's the base thing, 
Uh, if you don't want to do any of that, open energy monitor, you won't have to spend a lot of time on it. There's some resources, the slides are already on the website if you want to find all the links. Thank you very much. Oh. Sure you can do. I assume you want it mirrored instead of... Yeah. Uh, there you go. There you go. You should be set to go. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> Effort. Thanks, Mark. So, for some reason, I like LEDs. Linky, I know. I never got past that. Um, you may know those like uh, little LED matrices. This one's from uh, Adafruit, bicolor. Uh, you can get probably a tricolor. It's I2C. You see not many wires to it. It's very nice. But it really do only does two colors, as in green, red, or green and red, and that's it. You can't mix them to get anything in between. Um, and even the tricolor one, same thing. You can only mix three colors. Of course, you probably know you can use PWM on normal LED controls to select how much of the three colors you want to make any color in the spectrum. But you can't do that with those matrices. And I looked around, and I couldn't really find one um, that was off the shelf. So of course, they make those raw ones that just give you, oh, didn't mean to do that. Uh, try this one. Uh, there we go. Bear with me while I scroll back up. There you go. Those little guys that have a bunch of pins in the back, um, basically one pin for each row of green, one pin for each row of red, and then uh, eight pins for the ground lines. So it looks a bit like this. Um, now there's no controller anymore. You're actually the one controlling each LED. And uh, if you're doing math, you see there's 64 LEDs and you don't have enough pins to talk to each separately. The way it works is you have a line, um, a pin for the line, and then a pin for the column. And the way you light up an LED is you talk to them at the same time. And since you obviously want to light up more than one LED, you do a quick scan. So you light up, you select which rows you want for one line, and you light up line number one, and that shows you the first row. Then you go to the next one, while turning off the first one. And if you do it quickly enough, you scan all eight lines and you get that matrix. And the eye doesn't really see because you do it quickly enough. Uh, so that's easy for doing one color. Uh, so that was my first uh, test here. Um, and the idea is I want to reuse the Adafruit libraries, which have matrix, uh, matrix support, bitmaps, drawing lines, everything. So I don't want to do my own code, right? It's already been written. So eventually, after a bit of work, I got uh, this working. Um, so that was the bicolor LED. I'm probably going to, well, can I scroll down? No, no. OK, let me try that. Thank you. I'm not very good with Mac, sorry. So now it's showing basically uh, interrupt driven code, which to get a different colors will do what I'm doing, the matrix. And then it will scan eight times. And depending on what intensity I want, it will display the green eight times, or only seven times, or only one time. And you see the one time would actually blink a tiny bit. And that will give me eight uh, int uh, intensity levels. And then by mixing them, now I can get infinite colors between red and green. Um, not perfect, but at least you know, I get a bit more than what the other fruit uh, stuff can do. Um, and I saved a lot of money by saving like $20 and spending days of my time. So that was time well spent. Because <laughs> my time is free, of course. That's, uh, my time is entirely free. So that shows you kind of what it looks like in uh, scrolls. Now for like another 2 or $3 on top, you get the tricolor version, um, which is the same exact principle. Of course, now you have more uh, lines. You have red, green, and blue. Uh, by that time, I was running out of uh, control lines on my Arduino, so I had to use uh, shift registers. And the library I wrote basically uh, can either do direct port, which is what you see with the 
all the um, resistors on this side here. And otherwise, they go through a shift register for the extra lines. And you can mix and match whatever amount, depending on what controller you have and how many pins you have. Um, so now I can actually do real colors. Um, these are actually showing circles. So you're actually using the uh, so-called uh, code as opposed to sending a bitmap of any size. One minute, OK. That's just the bitmap uh, showing different colors you can display. And, and the end result looks like this. Full screen. Uh, it kind of flickers because of my camera. Uh, your eye actually doesn't really see that. Uh, that's just a demo of different uh, ways of mixing the colors. Um, that's a bitmap here that I draw a line on top. And it should show the other food stuff. Uh, colored bitmaps, which they did not support, but they do now with the code I sent them. Uh, I'll just fast forward a little bit. Don't care about that. Oh, did I just skip the good part? I think I did. Hold on. There we go. Hold on. That was the part I wanted to show. So, sorry. I have to let it run. So then I even have text crawling, right? And I didn't have to do any of that. I just reused all the other fruit stuff for hardware they actually never meant to support. So, there you go. Obviously, if you want the code, it's on my website, GitHub, and all that. Um, Miles is up next. Would you prefer a handheld mic or a mic? Hello, hello. All right, hello everyone. Um, I've got what you might call stupid wear with me here. Uh, it's a dumb thing I did at work that people said, you should go and show this to people. I was like, oh, it's pretty stupid. So. Early last year, I went to the Shenzhen uh, Maker, no, was it Hacker, Hacker Camp, which I've seen a few alumni of here. Um, <clears throat> and I bought myself some wide um, Kapton tape for theoretically putting on my 3D printer's heated bed. And then I realized the printer couldn't do heated at all, so I had this Kapton this tape. I also bought uh, an Arduino Teensy um, from uh, SparkFun and found out that it's an export com controlled device, so I had to write a little essay saying why I wanted to export this thing. And in the meantime, I bought one for $2 from China and it didn't really matter. Uh, another thing I bought was uh, 200 feet of funky 70s ribbon cable, you know, the rainbow cable. And that was sitting in the shed. I used a bit to tie up my tomatoes and stuff like that. And I also bought myself a um, one of these things, which is a cherry key sampler. There's six keys on here. They're all different uh, tactile responses. Um, and it's a little sort of metal tray that's it's got the key sitting in. I thought, well, these are all pretty cool things. Uh, at, sorry? Who uh, here's got an uh, SG box close to this room? Because we don't have it somewhere else because your room's still busy. Right. So, who, anyone here with the SG box? Okay. All right. Um, if anyone comes in, yes, can I sit down there and have a cup of coffee? Sure, leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> where was I? Uh, yeah, so at work I have to deal with these sort of network security devices. You have to keep typing in a password repeatedly to test things. And it was getting really annoying. On the, on the sort of SSH version, I could put a macro on the keyboard to say, right, enter that password, enter that password. Also need to plug in a keyboard and do this to a piece of hardware. I didn't have that. So I put all of those bits and pieces together, which is on the back here, we have a Teensy. We have the funky ribbon cable wired up to all these. It's got a little USB port on this side and all stuck together with very professional looking layers of Kapton tape. <laughs> so now I just plug this into the uh, hardware device and press this button and the totally secure testing password gets entered for me. And I can do that over and over again. <laughs> and I thought, well, I've got five other keys, so they'll all do other passwords for other things as well. Um, and I discovered that I haven't actually implemented this yet, but it has the TNG you can have access to writing to your Novram or I think it's Flash or something like that. So you could implement like a YubiKey protocol. Use this as a one-time password thing. So every time you press it, you get a new password. So that was my funky little hack that saves me a lot of effort at work. And now I don't work on that product anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, Bob, you're up next.
Yeah, and the PDF. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Bob. Is that all right? Sounding good? All right, good. Um, yeah, quickly, uh, I will go through this very quickly. Uh, these aren't my slides, so I guess I get to be forgiven for everything that goes wrong. Um, uh, basically, we've talked a lot about open hardware today, and I thought it was worth just sitting down for a few seconds and seeing uh, some of the tools that you could possibly use to do some of that. Uh, and the key tool involved in a lot of today's stuff was KiCad, uh, or KiCad, depending on how you like to say it. Um, uh, I'll skip all the history of all that and stuff, but uh, effectively, eh, there I am. Uh, it, it's a really interesting bit of CAD software. Uh, you've probably all worked with CAD in one form or another. I'm guessing it's mostly software guys around here, so uh, it's, it's as annoying and has its own little quirks as much as any other piece of CAD software. Uh, but it is pretty cool. Uh, there's a couple of reasons you should do that, but first, does anybody in here do open hardware? So, yeah, a few. These guys, you might have heard of them. Um, so yeah, and I'm guessing mostly it's uh, KiCad in here now, has been Eagle in the past. Yeah, still, still Eagle and KiCad. Anything else? Anybody else? What do you use? Upper. How was that? All right. No? Yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah, well, KiCad's got uh, some really good advantages. Uh, it's mostly around, uh, they, they do the, the FOSS principles really well. I mean, it's gratis uh, and it's Libre. Uh, it's backed by some pretty cool people at CERN, uh, who else, the Arduino uh, organization, they do it as well. Uh, there's very few limitations, I mean, if you're looking to do professional level PCBs, they're really starting to get a lot of tools in there. Uh, you can do just about anything with it. Um, that's what we just went through. Uh, it is cross-platform, so even if you're not a Linux guy, uh, yep. Um, and yeah, CERN is backing it a little bit, and I'm missing this here. Uh, that's what it looks like. Right, and uh, there's a lot of ongoing development work, so uh, it's something worth getting into now. You can see it really coming along, and they've really started to step up and become like you know, real professional software developers and adding things like uh, scheduled releases and, and uh, things that you can fall back on, uh, and it's not just a, a complete mess. Uh, so, if I can, I just thought I'd show you real quick uh, what it looks like. How are we going for time? A couple minutes, okay. Uh, as far as, uh, yeah. EE CAD tools, uh, it's pretty simple. You have your schematic capture and you have your PCB layout tools. Uh, anybody that's done this before won't be really surprised by that. Uh, this is the ESP plant that uh, we're working on today. Uh, you probably see several of them still kinking around the room. Uh, as you can see, you can get quite complicated. There's all your sort of usual tools. Uh, you've got hierarchical sheets even, so you can, uh, if you prefer, you can, oh, no. Uh, you can clean things up a little bit which we've done a little bit of here. Uh, so, yeah, that's diving into uh, a lower level of the hierarchy, and then you can come back out. Uh, so that all works. Uh, there's pretty good library support for both the schematics and the footprints. Uh, I'd really advise you just go have a look, because uh, there's a lot there. Um, and that's all pretty boring on the schematic side, so nothing new there. Uh, they are just putting some decent features into the PCB layout stuff. Mm. Where are you? Um, yeah, this is what you'll start with. <laughs> A blank screen. And, ooh, okay, well that's not working, but anyway. Um, I assure you it's cool. Uh, and there's a pretty supportive community, community out there, and you can always crib off of guys like Freetronics. Uh, they have some of their libraries published, uh, which thank you, I've used them personally, uh, and they've saved me a lot of time and effort. Um, anyway. That's just really it. KiCad, yeah, pretty awesome tool. Uh, go use it. Uh, anybody else? You want to add something, Angus? Or? I was going to try to make it work. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> it would have looked impressive. They even have uh, 3D rendering, right? Do I have it? No. Ah. Ah. You would have liked the 3D rendering. It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Thanks, guys. Any questions? Yeah. Cool. Great. Thanks, Bob. Steve, I think the last one, is that right? Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. We have one more. Arian will follow up for the last one. 
Okay. Um, I used to run a database company. Um, that thing still pays the mortgage, but I started doing something else a couple of years ago. And meanwhile, my wife Claire has joined me, and we started another company called OpenStem. And um, that kind of came out of a conversation we had at Perth about 3D printers and high schools. Now, sadly, I haven't actually built a 3D printer with a high school yet. Um, they keep buying off-the-shelf stuff. It's a whole other story. So 